Hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live session. I'm just going to adjust my laptop screen. <laughs> there we go. I feel like I can never quite get the microphone stand in the right place. It has a little bit of a mind of its own and wants to creep up a little bit. Anyway, <laughs> I'll try and stay above it somehow. There we go. All right. Just getting set up here, um, we're going to get started in around uh, eight minutes or so. So a little bit of time for you to log in, grab a cup of coffee if you'd like, or something more strong. Okay. getting a few things set up here. I think we're all good. Just check my screen. Good. Okay, that's all good. So if you're watching, you can just uh, log into the chat window and that will give you the chance to comment or ask questions during today's session. And well, let me see who's here as well, which is always nice. <laughs> I'm just going to update the message in the chat window, I think.
All right, a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. So if you're just joining us, you can log into the chat window on the page that you're watching and you can, uh, if you choose the guest option, you can actually change the display name if you would like to. So you can just uh, type something else in there, which helps me because otherwise it says that you're something like guest 786. <laughs> so if you change it to your actual name, it's uh, really good. And then... Uh, you can type a hello if you like into the chat window just to test it out and that will let you ask questions or make comments during the session. Still working on adjusting this um, <laughs> boom stand. It really does have a mind of its own. I'm going to get started in a, a minute. Hello, it's Jan. I can. T I, I saw you, I think, like the Facebook post that I put on today at the very last minute. <laughs> How are you? What time is it for you there? You're backwards, so it's not too bad. It's like five, or is it? Or, or f four? No, five, six, five. Okay, good. I can never remember which time of the year we're three hours or two hours different. <laughs> so <laughs> It's getting super dark here in the mornings. I'm so sad. The dog walking thing is not fun anymore at the moment, so it's a bit, it's a bit disappointing. And then we'll be changing... Well, I guess in a month or so, yeah, then it gets shorter days and shorter days. Anyway, it looks like it's really light here at the moment, but in fact, we've had grey skies all day. So yeah, <laughs> Taylor's having silly. I actually do like it. I don't complain about it. Um, unlike particularly the Queenslanders really hate it. But the thing is the time differences, which all get kind of different and messed up and tonight's session is at a terrible time for the people in the US uh, eastern states it's like 4 a.m there at the moment so we will not get a lot of people online but that's okay I will run it anyway and the recording will be there for them after excellent all right I'm going to get started I will pause um, throughout the the thing tonight and uh, just check in on the chat window as we go but I'll switch over to sharing my screen with you and I will pop back in on uh, at the end. Let me just uh, change the view here. Okay, I think that's good. There we go. You should see the screen change in just a second. There we go. I've got my iPad showing what you see just so I can keep on, on top of that. So welcome to the February... 2020, I still can't work out whether I'm saying 2020 or 2020, uh, best tools for creating beautiful teaching resources session. So as usual, I would love to make a big welcome to my Midnight Music community members that might be joining us and any non-members that are joining us for a little bit of a look at the sorts of things that we do inside the community, like training sessions like this. And I just wanted to remind anyone who is a member that you can get a professional development certificate for this session, plus the handout links and resources and so on of things that I will be mentioning tonight. So for members, I'll give you a copy of the slides that I'm showing tonight. If you're not a member, I will actually post a collection of links towards the end of the session of things that I'm mentioning tonight, uh, most of them at least. And uh, that will just help out if you want to follow up with anything. Then uh, members also get access to the recording. So if you can't make it live, it's not too much of a problem like today's time, which is really terrible for people in the US <laughs> at the moment, uh, just due to the time changes and so on. 
So if uh, you happen to have tech issues during the session, just try refreshing your browser. There is a little bit of a delay between what I do and what you actually see. You won't really notice that at all while we're going along. And I mentioned if you were here a little bit early that you can log into that chat window that you can see on the screen there. And that just allows, um, allows me to see who's online, but also allows you to ask questions or post comments throughout the session. Now, I'm going to have a substantial question time at the end if there's anyone on at that time, and you can ask me anything you like, not necessarily about today's session, but any music tech kind of questions. So, as usual, this will be the format for today's session. It's going to be uh, a little bit on what's new in the Midnight Music community, what things have been happening there. I'll mention some favourite shares and posts that have gone on in our forum section I will get head into today's actual training and then that question and answer time at the end. Okay, so starting off with what's new just briefly in the Midnight Music community. And in terms of new training and resources that have been recently added, it's been uh, a little bit less this month than usual, uh, mainly because I've been away in Texas. So uh, we've added in the Escape Rooms live January training that happened last month. So if you did miss out on that, it was a super popular one. Uh, so do go and check that out. Um, the Escape Room thing is really fun and I'm currently developing a like a hands-on workshop for that. So uh, Jan, I will be doing that in Perth at the daytime conference. Uh, so if you're there, hopefully you'll come and join in with that. Um, other than that, uh, the resource bank, uh, which is a collection of places that we have downloads of PDFs and useful um, resources for teachers, uh, we've added some of the Canva theme month that we've been having, uh, some of the handouts uh, for blog posts that we've been publishing. And we've gone a bit Canva crazy lately because it became free last December for teachers to use uh, basically the pro features of the account. And if you don't know what Canva is, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. But in, in essence, it's a graphic design tool, super useful for, for creating resources. And just to recap some of the favourite shares and posts in case you missed them that have happened inside the community. Amy was uh, interested in finding something that would capture found sounds and then uh, allowed her students to compose with them on the iPad. So she was looking for kind of an audacity substitute really, but a couple of us suggested that she check out SampleBot, which is an app on the iPad, which is basically designed for exactly what she wants to do and it's lots of fun so I think she's gone off to, to have a play with that. Uh, Jennifer actually created an escape room following the instructions that I put in the community and if you remember you can actually log in and she's shared her escape room and the way she set that up so it's really good seeing lots of other people's escape room setups because it just gives you your own ideas of how things can work. I shared a couple of things that I found useful links and so on uh, throughout time and uh, one of them was this YouTube piano which sounds really bizarre but someone's basically set up a video which shows a piano keyboard and you can press certain letters on your computer keyboard and it will play notes showing on the piano keyboard that's on the YouTube video. Now when you first try it it seems kind of magical like I did guess how they had actually done this straight away but it seems weird that you can actually control a piano that's showing on a YouTube video <laughs> but the way they've done this is the person has recorded each individual note one after the other and they've left them for you know sort of to ring for quite a while each note um, and what you do in YouTube is that you can set up timestamps which allow the person to jump to a specific spot in the video so they've recorded each individual note added a timestamp for each of the pictures and there are keyboard shortcuts that YouTube has generally to allow you to jump through different timestamps in the video. So you can basically play it. It's not something I would suggest giving, uh, you know, a link to students so that they can play melodies that you're doing in class and so on. It's, it's fairly limited. But I just thought it was a really interesting way of using YouTube and timestamps. So just a sort of a unique approach there. Now, another thing that I did uh, find and stumble across, um, I think this was on Twitter. Someone had shared a classroom screen. Maybe it was in a Facebook group. 
Classroom Screen is a website that you can go to and it acts as basically a dashboard or a desktop for you as the teacher. It's something that you can display on your data projector and it allows you to add basically widgets to your screen that you might find useful during class time. So there's things like a timer, there's a calendar, there's a polling system, which so students can actually uh, be given a poll. You can set up a question like an exit ticket sort of thing and ask them, um, you know, what did you learn in the lesson or so on. Basically, um, yes and no answers work better. That wasn't a good example that I just mentioned. Uh, but things like that. There's other things you can set up on there. And one of the really useful things is a sound meter. So this allows you, if you turn this on and add this to your screen, it allows the students to visually see how loud the classroom is or how quiet the classroom is. And you can have a little um, a sign on your screen which also says that you're allowing quiet conversation to go on or that you require it to be a silent classroom for the moment or that you allow the person to talk softly to their neighbour. So you can set those sort of parameters for them and just allows you maybe to save your voice a little bit. So I think it's a really useful one. Also in the community, I'm starting to share some links from the sessions that I ran at the Texas Music Educators Association conference, which I just returned from. I literally got back yesterday morning and today yesterday I was sort of okay and awake all day and today I feel really jet lagged so I really hope that I stay on track tonight and last the session I'm sure it'll be fine um, but yeah on the way there to Texas I really don't suffer from jet lag at all when I arrive but coming home it's just that going a different direction around the world thing man it's it really hits me when I get back here so yep so hopefully we'll be all good tonight <laughs> I just thought I'd briefly mention a few things that I did uh, discover, and this is not everything, I just picked four things that I discovered when I was at the Texas conference that other presenters had mentioned. So I tried to go to, you know, as many other sessions as I could. I really love seeing other people present and not only to learn about new apps and so on, and I always do learn about new apps and websites and so on because you can't possibly keep up with everything, uh, but also I just love to see the way people present and the sorts of projects they might be doing with their students in class. And uh, there was a few things that came out, sort of uh, specific links or apps, and I thought I'd mention these four. So Amy Burns let me know that she discovered in someone else's session, it wasn't actually in her session, but she discovered a Chrome extension which is called Transpose. And what you do is install this in Chrome and then when you go to YouTube or I think it's any website that has a video showing on the screen, the Transpose Chrome extension will give you some extra buttons like transpose this video up a semitone or down a semitone or up a third or down a third and so on. Uh, there's also controls for slowing down and speeding up the video. Now, you can do that bit in YouTube itself, but this sort of saves you going into the YouTube video settings to do that. It's all in this little Chrome extension. I think from memory it might do something else too and I cannot remember what that is, but there is a paid version of this, but the free version does those things that I mentioned, so it might be something worth exploring. Now, Amy Burns, um, who's an elementary music teacher who was at the conference, she actually mentioned uh, the next one in her session, uh, which is that there are a series of apps by Duck Duck Moose, that's the name of the developer, and they're song apps, and they're kind of like song storybook apps, essentially, where you can see pictures on the screen and the stories written throughout. Now, Amy was showing an example how uh, of how a couple of those apps, not I don't think it's all of them, but a couple of those apps have a record button in them. So you as a teacher or the students can actually record yourself singing those songs. So each of the apps is a separate song, a story song, and you can um, you can go ahead and record your own voice singing them. And she played us an example of one of her daughters singing uh, one of the songs, and it was really beautiful. <laughs> Uh, then another session I went to, which was by Ian uh, Boynton, and he did a, vid a video session showing uh, projects that he does with elementary students, all to do with video. And he reminded me actually of this stop motion app. I have heard about it before, but I'd forgotten about it. So if you're wanting to do video projects and sort of film scoring type projects, 
a really good thing is to actually get kids to make their own videos and it might be something that you would do in conjunction with another teacher but the stop motion app allows you to create stop motion animation films uh, quite easily so I'm really going to go and um, check that out and then the last thing wasn't really in a session but I, I caught up with Katie Dwinal who works for Quaver Music over there and she and I have known each other for quite some time and she mentioned in her session which I couldn't go to that she talked about virtual field trips uh, with the teachers in her session and uh, she used Google Maps VR function, which allows you to kind of go and visit a place and it's um, like a virtual reality experience. So fantastic idea. We were talking about the fact that it'd be great to, uh, you know, give kids a research project based on maybe a composer or a country with a specific style of music and they could use Google Maps to go and visit that country and actually have a look at the things or visit the birthplace of the composer or see where the artist grows up and, and that sort of thing. Again, I feel like that's going to be a future session for me in some, <laughs> some way, shape or form. Okay, so let's get on to the main training part for tonight's session. And this is all about the best tools that you can use to create your own beautiful teaching resources. So in this session, I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of resources that I'm referring to. I'm going to uh, talk about the sorts of features that you'd want to look for in the software that you want to use to create those resources. I'm going to talk about which types of software you shouldn't use or most of the time shouldn't use. And I've got I've got five here. I've actually got four, total of four tech tool options. I decided to leave one out because the session was going to get too long. So that should say four there. So let's talk about the types of resources that you might want to create. So I'm referring to things like lesson introductions and announcements that you're going to show on your screen on the data projector, um, classroom posters that you or the students might create, worksheets that you might create, and that might include things like puzzles and so on. Uh, you might want to be creating sing-along or play-along charts or games and quizzes and so on and really sorts of things that you might find on Teachers Pay Teachers. So on Teachers Pay Teachers, if you think about those resources, the best ones are the ones that are beautiful to look at, they're clear and easy to use and they might have bright colours and clip art and images and nice fonts and so on. And it just makes it a lot more interesting for students. And I think also if you use all those design aspects in the right way, you're going to allow the students to rem remember more easily what it is you want to get across, so the information that you're trying to teach. So that's the sort of resources I'm referring to tonight. You'll see a few little examples along the way of the sorts of things that I've made with the different tools that I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, but really it's any of these. Now, in terms of the features of what to look for in the software that you're going to use is that you want it to be like a canvas. And when I say canvas, you want to have like a blank screen or a blank page where you can place elements that you're going to use in your design. So you might have a bit of text, you might have a large title, you might have some images on the screen, you might have, um, because we're music teachers, you might have notation images or chord diagrams and so on. And you really want that software to give you the option to move those elements really freely around on the page. Another thing that's really good, if you can find software of some kind that has built-in design elements, and by that I mean that within the software, there might be a supply of things that you can use to actually create your resources. So there might be shapes that you can use, um, icons that you can use. There could be images and different fonts and backgrounds and so on, patterns perhaps. So having software that already has those things included can just shortcut a lot of your work then you want to have some you can use. So sometimes you might want to create a poster for your classroom, which is, uh, which one is it? Portrait, <laughs> portrait size or portrait layout. Other times you want to perhaps make a worksheet where things are, you know, sideways. So you're in that landscape mode. 
Sometimes you might be wanting to create things that you need to print out. Sometimes it might be a postcard size that you need or a bookmark shape. Uh, so you want to be able to have flexibility with the dimensions that you set your screen at or your, your software um, canvas. You also need a bit of flexibility with the download option. So can you download it as a PDF or as an image or some other type of format? And uh, what type of media will um, be allowed to go into the resource that you're creating? So can you add audio and can you add video into that as well as all the other usual things? Now, in terms of what doesn't work so well, I've only got one thing on this one, <laughs> on this page, which is word processing software. Now, it's not quite true that you would never use things like Word or Pages or Google Docs to create these sorts of resources but I just find it's going to be a lot more frustrating. So depending on the type of thing that you're creating, if it's got a lot of text, you may consider using Word or Pages or Google Docs. However, if there are more sort of design things like images and you need to have that freedom of moving things around, you're going to be much better off in one of, those, one of the other options that I'm about to mention. Um, and that's simply because you can still do the text, but you've got more freedom of formatting. You may have had the experience where you've tried to use Word and you kind of try and add pictures in and then things get thrown out and font sizes don't quite work or pictures don't fit quite where you want them to and you can't move them exactly into that spot because there's text in the way and we've all had that experience before. So using something different is a better solution. So I've got a total of four things to talk about tonight. So three main options and I've thrown in a bonus one, which is a little bit different, but really kind of fun and cool. So the three main ones I'm going to talk about tonight are PowerPoint and Keynote, which I'm counting as one single option because they are really kind of the same. Just one is for PC and one is for Mac, although PowerPoint is also on the Mac as well. I'm going to talk a bit about Google Slides and I'm going to talk about Canva, which I mentioned in the opening. Now, even if you've used these before, hopefully you'll uh, maybe learn a few things about uh, each of them as we go along and particularly Canva. I find people don't know Canva so much. So PowerPoint and Keynote, I've called them here the old favourites and uh, they've been around for a long time. So PowerPoint looks like this. Uh, this is just an image of a lyric video that I made using PowerPoint. And you can see I chose a really brightly coloured background because PowerPoint, I find PowerPoint when I open it up, it seems really dry. And I think that's a throwback to, you know, how long it's been around. Uh, but basically you can use it, you know, for all of these things. And like I said, it's got that canvas type option where you've got a, a free screen where you can drag things around and place elements wherever you want. Now, Keynote is essentially the same thing and allows you to do the same sorts of things. This is a, a screenshot of a Peter and the Wolf thing that I created in PowerPoint. And I've used both to create identical things. So it's not, you know, one or the other. So examples of things that I've created in either PowerPoint or Keynote are things like this. So you've got sort of things that you would display on the board with that teddy bear uh, option down the bottom. You might show that on the data projector and have kids clap the rhythm. I deliberately made that one look quite like the Canva type resources that you can purchase um, just to illustrate to people how you can actually make that yourself. And on the other side, I've got a, a little sort of an example of something that you might find in a keyboard, uh, you know, how to type book or uh, worksheet that you might print out for students. So both of those were made in PowerPoint or Keynote. The other thing that you can do with both PowerPoint and Keynote is actually to change the dimensions so that you're not in the traditional landscape view and you're actually in the portrait view. So if you do want to create worksheets and so on and you need to print them out on A4 paper or letter size paper if you're in the US, you can just go into your PowerPoint or Keynote document settings and actually set the page up to be this dimension. When I've done that in the past, I've basically Googled what are the dimensions of an A4 page or a letter page and then found them because they're not in there by default as an option for setting up your PowerPoint or Keynote files. So just go ahead and uh, you just type the dimensions in and then you end up with this sort of thing. So it works really well even though you're not now using it as a presentation tool, you're now using it as a resource creation tool. 
Now, the good things about either PowerPoint and Keynote, and I'm not going to go into all the instructions of how to create those things because I've actually done another session on that separately, but this is all about why choose the tools that you might choose. The good things about PowerPoint and Keynote are that they live locally on your laptop or desktop computer, so the software lives there locally, i.e. it's not online. They both handle audio and video pretty well, and this is unlike a couple of the other options I'm going to talk about. They both have multiple, multiple, multiple transition options. Now, this is only really relevant if you're using these for actual presentations or even to create videos. So I'm not sure if people do this so much, but you know, if you create a series of slides, you can actually turn them into a video just by exporting your presentation as a video file. And this is where those transitions may come in handy. And also if you are actually using it as a presentation tool. The other thing I do like about these options is there are some really quite granular formatting options. So when you can get down to sort of the nitty gritty of moving elements around and sizing them and lining things up, there are lots and lots of formatting options in PowerPoint and Keynote. Now I'm going to talk a few about a few of the drawbacks of PowerPoint and Keynote and why you might choose one of the other options. And here are the ones that I came up with. Um, there is not a huge inbuilt library of design elements. Now, there are a few things. There are some shapes that you can use and a collection of kind of like icons that you can add to the page and then change color and change size. But it's very, very limited. You're limited to only that. And so there's really not much there. I've also put there are limited inbuilt templates. There are quite a number of templates in those, uh, those software options but they're all geared towards presentations and not towards uh, resources that you might create such as posters or infographics or uh, postcards and so on. They're really uh, geared towards the presentations and I feel like they're getting a little bit dated looking. So um, what you can do to overcome that is actually to go and seek out templates which are maybe free online that someone else has created um, which look kind of cooler than what's already in there. Now, with Keynote and PowerPoint, the sharing and collaboration aspects are much more difficult than the other options I'm going to talk about. That may or may not be a thing for you. You may not actually need to share or collaborate, but it's just a thing to consider if you do want to go down that road. And then they're not as easily readily available across all devices. For instance, uh, Keynote on an iPad as, a as opposed to a Mac desktop or laptop computer is quite different. Keynote on the um, iPad is more limited than the other ones. And I've found that if I've created something on my Mac and then sent it across to my iPad, uh, sometimes things don't end up looking the same on the iPad version. And often it's to do with fonts that I've got available on my Mac and not on my iPad. And so sometimes the formatting gets messed up. The screen size is also different dimensions. So, you know, it's not, it's not so good to transfer back and forth. Let's talk about this second option being Google Slides. And to be honest, the more I use Google Slides, the more I really, really love it. Now, Google Slides really is pretty similar to Keynote and PowerPoint. Again, it does the same kind of thing. It has some differences though, which I'll talk about, but you can really do a lot with Google Slides and it's getting better and better each day. Lots of fun. Now, the picture I've got on the screen here is a template which I downloaded for free from a fantastic website called Slides Mania. So if you are using Google Slides and you want to get some templates to use, which look really cool, uh, Slides Mania has a brilliant array and there are new ones added every week. The, the woman who does the designing there, and I've forgotten her name at the moment, but she does some beautiful work and I just picked one to show you here. This is a space theme presentation, obviously, uh, but it's so gorgeous and lovely to look at and really cool. You can actually use the template, but then change things in it. You can actually change the fonts if you want to, uh, but the template's there and you, you don't want to mess with it too much because it already looks so beautiful. So go and, go and check that out. I'll pop a link in uh, for you for Slides Mania at the end of the session. But other things that you might create in Google Slides, again, 
all the things I've shown you for PowerPoint and Keynote, I can create exactly the same thing in Google Slides. Uh, and these things as well that I'm showing you here, which were created in Slides, can also be created exactly the same in PowerPoint and Keynote. So you can see I've got a, just a simple blues ukulele chord progression there. Uh, the one on the bottom right is a, an example, excuse me, of a Teachers Pay Teachers product where on Teachers Pay Teachers you need to have a little preview of your product. So we actually created it in Google Slides. And it just gives you, again, that freedom to add images, to add text, to add icons. The icons that you can see next to the words video walkthrough and grades three to eight, uh, we've added those in to just demonstrate what this resource is about. So that's the sort of thing you can create there. Another example, this kind of thing where there's like a, a sing-along um, and play-along chart that you might be showing students on the screen. So I've just got the first three pages of this example. But you can set it up like a presentation, uh, hit play on the backing track that you're going to get them to play along with and then just advance the slides on through each line as the students are playing along. So the good things about Google Slides is that it lives online. Now, when I've said good things and drawbacks about PowerPoint and Keynote, to be honest, um, all of them can be good things and bad things as well. So <laughs> one of the good things about Google Slides is it lives online. And I'm going to actually show you in a second that one of the drawbacks is that Google Slides lives online. So it can be a benefit and a drawback at the same time. But it does live online, which means it's kind of just there. You don't need to remember your file. You need to just log into your Google account. Um, you can now add insert audio into your Google Slides and also a link to a video. You can actually embed a video in there. So that's um, always been there. The insert audio function is much more recent. They've had a bit of teething issues with that, but now it's there. Sharing a Google Slides document is super easy because you just need to share a link and give people the permission to access it. Google Slides, of course, is really great for collaboration because it's um, easy in any Google type a product like Google Documents or spreadsheets or slides, you can give more than one person access to it and you can actually edit the same thing at the same time if, even if you want to. Another thing I like about Google Slides is that you can access it from any device which makes it super easy. And it does have an inbuilt search function for finding legal images to use in your presentations. So if you actually go and insert an image and actually want to search for something because you don't have one on your desktop, once you do a search for images, Google will only show you things that are labelled in the search results for reuse of some kind. So in essence, it's showing you things that are Creative Commons licensed. You may need to attribute the person or public domain. So that, that makes it a little bit easier. So drawbacks of Google Slides as an option for creating resources is there's not a huge library of inbuilt design elements. You do have that search function on the side there, but you still got to kind of bring the image in and keep looking for things and so on. The audio and video options, although they're there, a little bit more clunky than PowerPoint or Keynote. So if I am doing something which requires video and audio in a more heavy way, I suppose, I would tend to go for Keynote uh, on my own Mac. I mentioned that it's a, a good thing and a bad thing that it's an online software tool. So it does require internet access. And if you don't have access to the internet, it makes things a little bit more difficult. Um, what you can do ahead of time, and I, I think this works for slides as well as everything else, um, ahead of time, you can actually ask Google, uh, your Google Drive to allow you access to this when you're offline. You need to kind of make sure you go in and, and and say, I want to use this offline before you need to do that. It's no good trying to do that when you don't have internet access, if you know what I mean. You need to think ahead a little bit. So when I'm getting on a plane, I actually go through what are the things in my Google Drive that I might need access to while I'm on the plane and potentially don't have internet access. And I will make sure that they're all available offline in my Google Drive. And lastly, Google Slides is really great, but there's kind of fewer formatting options. So sometimes I get a little bit frustrated. It doesn't always do the things I want it to do. And sometimes I'll go back to Keynote because of that reason. 
So my third option tonight, third one out of the three main ones, is Canva, which I mentioned earlier. Now, if you haven't used Canva already, Canva is a graphic design tool. And I think because of this reason, you know, a lot of teachers thought, well, I'm not a graphic designer, so why would I use a graphic design software tool? But really, Canva does so much and it's super simple to use and I can really strongly encourage having a go at using it if you haven't. Um, there are many, many benefits to using Canva. It's not always my first go-to choice, but it's becoming more and more my main choice, especially when I'm creating resources like worksheets or puzzles or uh, games and sort of things which need a a nice design look and feel to them. This is what the Canva um, website looks like when you first log in and then when you're actually inside designing something, it looks kind of like this. So the thing that you're designing is on the right-hand side and this is an example of just a, one of the escape room puzzles actually that I created for my example escape room. And on the left-hand side there you can see that I've got brought up on the screen, I've brought up some design elements which are actually included in Canva, which you can use in your designs. So this puzzle for the escape room that I made as an example, essentially it's just a, a, a slide which I've given a blue background and then the little chef guy and the cookies on the right hand side of the screen, I found those in the Canva, li Canva library of elements and it was really easy to do that because I just went in there. That basically the escape room that I set up had a, um, a cookie theme <laughs> so I went into Canva and I thought, okay, for this one I want to decorate it with the cookies and the chef and I just searched for with the word chef in the Canva elements collection and up popped multiple examples of chefs that I could use, pictures, clip art, illustrations and so on. And I chose the one I liked and then I went in and searched for cookies. And again, multiple options popped up and I just picked something I liked and popped it in there. And then all I did was add the text boxes on the screen and the white text, uh, the, the rectangles that are behind each of the text words. I just added those to make it look um, look kind of nice. So that was really it and I love the fact that all these design elements are in there. So let me just show you a couple more examples of things that have uh, created inside Canva. So this one here, I didn't actually do this by myself, my content manager Daya did it and it did a fantastic job, I really love it. So uh, we used one of the um, certificate templates that's in Canva. So a template will give you the layout of everything and then you can go and change the font style perhaps or the images that they use in the, temp in the template itself. So Day has gone ahead and put music icons in there which look really cool all down the left-hand side and the text was adjusted to match what we needed to do. And again, this one here, uh, this is digital badges, so little images which I provide as badges when people achieve certain things that they're learning inside the Midnight Music community. I actually designed these for a free challenge that I did uh, last, last year. I did it a couple of times. So we had a video game music level one badge that people could earn and an audio QR codes level one badge and three other badges as well. And I really wanted something to look nice to give people as this digital badge. So what I did was went into Canva. I found the, the dark blue circle at the back there. I found, um, so it's a circle with a, a white ring in it. I changed the colour so that it matched my business colours. I found that red ribbon kind of shape. I found the little icon of the controller that the person's holding. I added the music notes. And with the one on the right, I found that image with the microphone in the hand. So all of those things are inside Canva, which is why I love it because it's just all there and I didn't need to go out to other websites and actually search down these things and add them in after the fact into my design. Super simple to use. And once you're inside Canva, um, you can basically access nearly all of these elements for free. Some of them are paid, but um, most of them are free. Another quick example is actual presentations. So this one is a presentation and I've just pop, popped those images on the right-hand side at an angle there to make them look a bit funky. But, but basically each of those, again, the pictures that you see there were found from the Canva 
library and I just put the text on the screen. So again, that was a really simple one to create. And this last example, just of a couple of posters, these again are used um, by making Canva, uh, using Canva templates and then just adjusting them. So that Battle of the Bands one in the middle there was originally an orange and yellow jazz poster and I just changed it. I changed the colours, I changed the text uh, font style, I added a, an electric guitar picture instead of the jazz saxophone that they had in there and so on. So I've just made it totally different and yet the same because I really did keep to the template layout. The MIDI versus audio infographic there, that's again a template from Canva and we just adjusted it for our own needs. The one on the right I made from scratch and that um, essentially is super simple to make. It was just a quick uh, bit of font, uh, what do you call it, text on the screen. And the 8S letters are actually they're actually blank frames, so it's a blank eight and then you can drag in a picture that you want to go into the shape of the eight. So I found a nice rainbow sort of hand-drawn background image, I dragged it in and that's what it ended up looking like. So really super simple to make. So the good thing about Canva is, again, it lives online, which is a benefit, can be a drawback too, but is a benefit. This huge library of design elements, I really cannot describe how big the collection is. So until you go in and check it out for yourself, um, each day even I'm still kind of blown away by the number of things that are in there. So in addition to the, the clip art and the images and so on, this library of templates is huge. So when you go in there, you can basically say, look, I want to make a poster and you type that in and then it shows you hundreds of different poster templates and then you pick one that sort of looks like what you want and then you just um, take it in and then adjust all the, the different things in it. Uh, in addition to that, they have borders, frames, patterns, lots of things. And once you go in there, yeah, I, you, it's kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> Another benefit is that it has its own inbuilt QR code maker. So, if you want to have a QR code appear on the poster that you're making for your students or for your classroom, you can actually add the QR code from within Canva. You just go to a, a place where it says, hey, what do you want to make into a QR code? You paste the URL of the thing that you want to the QR code to go to and it will pop a QR code straight onto your design for you. So if you've ever done this, um, you'll know that normally you would need to go to a separate QR code making website. You would get your QR code set up there, you would download it as an image, then you would import it into Keynote or PowerPoint or whatever you're using and do it that way. Having one inside Canva just takes away a few steps, it just makes it easier. Once again, um, the sharing and collaboration aspects of Canva are really easy and um, much more easy than PowerPoint or Keynote. So again, if that's the sort of thing you're interested in, this would be a good choice for that. You can access Canva from any device. They do have an app version if you want to try the app version. I prefer personally to do it all on my laptop because I just find the screen real estate is much better. But some people do like to create designs while they're on their phone or their iPad or other tablet device. And I haven't even yet mentioned that, uh, and this is the reason I've been doing a lot of things with Canva lately, is that they made the basically the pro version of Canva, they have now made that free for education people. So if you're a teacher, you can actually fill out a form and say, hey, I'm a teacher, and you, need, you do need to prove that, so you need to send them some kind of proof like a teaching uh, qualification or certificate or letter from your school. Once you can prove that to them, they will open up the education account for you. So this gives you access rather than limited uh, design elements that are in the free option, you'll actually get access to a lot more things. So we're talking like 60,000 design elements instead of just 8,000, something like that. Don't quote me on the numbers, but you get a lot more once you sign up for that education account rather than just having the general free Canva account. Now, I will put a link, I've got a collection of links for tonight and I will actually put a link in for the education version if you want to apply for that. You do need to have the regular free Canva account first and then you say, hey, I'm an educator and they will make that account open up to be the education version. So 
A few drawbacks with Canva, um, only simple and audio, simple audio and video uh, is possible with Canva. So, you know, if you want to do complex things, um, that may, be not, may not be a good option for you, but it actually allows you to make videos inside Canva, which kind of blew my mind. This is a relatively new feature. So what you can do is actually say, hey, I want to create a video and there's even stock video inside the Canberra, uh, Canberra, I keep saying Canberra, which is a place in Australia for those <laughs> who may not know. Oh my gosh, my jet lagged brain, honestly. Um, there's stock video inside Canva, which allows you to um, drag that onto your screen and you can add some text over the top. So if you want to make a really simple video, let's say you're advertising an upcoming event at school, so your concert's coming up. You can just have some simple text on the screen saying uh, spring concert coming up or Easter event or whatever it is and find some video that, that kind of fits okay with that and have that on in the background and that can become a little social media promotion tool so you can download the video and then upload it to things like Facebook saying, hey, you know, we've got this thing coming up. Simple video it makes it really easy to do. If you're wanting to do complex videos, Canva's not the tool to do it. But if you just want to keep it simple, a great option. Really, really good. Because of that, they also have some background music in there that you can use. Um, and so the video and, and audio, are uh, you have copyright permission to use these things um, in your, you know, things that you're creating. Now, a drawback, again, can be that uh, Canva requires internet access. I've put for now in brackets because they've actually said that there's a Canva app coming. Uh, and by app, I mean like a desktop app. So if you're on your laptop, you don't I'm, I'm guessing that it means that you won't necessarily need to be logged in to the internet on a browser. I could be wrong about that totally. Uh, even if you have a local app that lives on your, your laptop, it may still need internet access to work. I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen. So I've put for now, but it may not, <laughs> it may not be that it doesn't require internet access in the future. We'll see. Then the only other drawback really is that there are sort of limited transitions and that's those, you know, sort of fancy effects that you can have between slides if you're using, um, a, creating a presentation of some sort. Again, that may not even be an issue for you, but I just sort of pop that in there. So there are really not that many drawbacks to Canva at all and this is why more and more I'm actually using it and relying on it. And if you had noticed the early examples of things that I showed you, which I had created in PowerPoint and Keynote and then in Google Slides, if you notice the Canva ones after that, they look a lot more professional because, and that's because I've used templates which have been created by professionals, um, by graphic designers. So it kind of lifts your game a lot when you use their templates in that way. I just thought I'd show you, this is the list of design elements that you have already inside Canva that you can use to create all these fabulous designs. So templates, like I mentioned, there are hundreds of templates for all sorts of different things. I search for something random. I, I haven't even found, I don't think, or been through the entire list of all the templates that they have because there are so many. If you search, though, on their templates page, you can just type in things like um, CV resume and there'll be lots of examples of that that you can use. Um, you can type in things. I typed in bookmark the other day because I thought, oh, that would be a cool project for kids to create bookmarks to illustrate something and then have them printed. Um, and there are already lots of bookmark <laughs> design templates inside Canva. I actually thought I'd have to look up the dimensions and make my own, but no, it's already in there. There are lots of worksheet templates in there. There are many poster templates. There are just all sorts of other things, anything you can possibly imagine. Um, and one thing I will mention, which is super easy to do in Canva, is that they have a template set up for things like photo collages. So what you can do is choose a layout of, of images and then you drag your images into each spot. So the layout might be sort of uh, maybe four images on the screen which are separated by, you know, a white border between the four and they might be all even sizes. You can also find templates for photo collages where there's one big photo and three small ones down the side or a, a one that's in the shape of a circle and then, the you know, the others are not. 
um, really useful templates like that where you're not having to fiddle with the resizing and rotation of the photos to get that effect yourself. It's just kind of all done for you. So in addition to the templates, um, lots of different fonts, which are kind of cool and funky fonts. There are images and clip art, the borders and backgrounds. They even have animated stickers, which are so cool. Um, basically, they're little, it's like clip art that, that moves in some way. And so once you add that to your design, it, it moves around and you download your design as a video or as a GIF, which you can then send to people. And it will keep that animated effect in there. And like I mentioned, they have the stock video and music in there too. So I did mention that um, Canva for Education is there, so you can go and apply uh, for that um, if you want to and if you've already got your free Canva account set up. And I will also mention that because Canva became free in December, I had already been planning on making a new course which is all about creating your own uh, design uh, what do you call it, designing your own teaching resources. And my idea initially was to use Google Slides because that is something that will work for everybody. But in fact, I've ended up deciding to do it all in Canva because there's so many of these design elements included in that. So if you're interested in that new course and you want to just go on the wait list and be informed when it's ready, uh, there's a link there, midnightmusic.com.au forward slash CBTR, which stands for Create Beautiful Teaching Resources, which has a lovely logo designed by Daya. So <laughs> there we go. That's on the screen there. I will also include that link in the list of links, which I'll provide in a second. Now, I've got one little bonus one to, to share with you. And again, I, I used a couple of these years ago, which was word art generators. So this is a place where you, you type in a whole bunch of words into a website and then click a button and it gives you back all of those words in the shape of a heart or a treble clef or some other kind of nice shape. And it makes for really useful art that you can print out and use in your classroom or add to your presentations or put on a poster and so on. Now, this particular website um, I, I, is not one that I had used before, but this one is simply called Word Art and it allows you to create all sorts of things. And there's some great options in there and no kidding once you start playing with this it's very difficult to stop so that you can see an example on the right hand side there but there are lots of options for changing colors and images and making something bold in the middle and then have everything everything else small around it so you can see that example there I'm going to show you a couple of others but in essence these work by you typing in a series of words or you can import words. So if you've got words in a list somewhere, you can actually import them all in one go and ask the software to generate this word art for you. You could do this with the names of the kids in your class or in your music ensemble. So if you wanted to make a, a word art based on all the names of the students that are in your big band ensemble or your choir, you could totally do that really easily. You just import the list. Then you choose what shape you want this to be in. You choose your fonts and your colours and you click the visualise button and it generates this piece of word art. And I've put that you can also use emoji. So let me just explain that in a moment. Here are a couple of word art examples. These ones I did today. So you can see I chose a guitar shape on the left-hand side and there's all words to do with the blues on that one. The one in the middle is dynamics and I'm, I deliberately made the word dynamics appear only once in the whole image and I made it black so that it acts like a title and then all of the other coloured words are words that are to do with dynamics in music. And the one on the right hand side again is just about sort of music related things, sing, dance, create, play, expressive, lyrical and so on. And I chose different colours again, chose different font and made it into the quaver shape. Now, I will explain that with the blues one on the left there, the guitar, what I did with that one is that you can have the option of typing words in yourself or you can import them from a list, like I said. So it could be from a, a, a .csv file. Or the third option is that you can actually put in the URL of a website and ask it to use the words on that web page 
to generate your word art. So I actually put in the Wikipedia blues page into the URL box and then you can do some things like, it, I mean, it's going to give you hundreds and hundreds of words there. So I got rid of a lot of the lower on the list ones, words that were not meaningful as such, and I just kept sort of the upper part of the list. Now, what it did was actually bring the words in from the Wikipedia page, uh, kind of in order of how many times that word appears on the page. So some of the larger words that you can see in this image are larger because the word blues and the word music and the word record and style appear more times on the Wikipedia page than the other words, which are much smaller. Now, you can you can change that if you want to. You have control over that manually if you want to, but I just thought that was really cool. Wikipedia kind of did it for me and the Word Art um, website did it for me, so that was really good. Jan loves the dynamic sign. Thank you. That shape's pretty cool, isn't it? I love um, – so essentially that shape – had those sections and when I was looking at the shape I thought oh I wonder when I pop my words in whether they're going to be in the colors of the sections that I could see on the shape and yes they were I really like it too so it's like a, a, a pentagon I guess is it and yeah the the shape's nice on the inside so very cool I haven't even tried this yet but you can actually upload your own shape for it to base the art on if you want to I think that would be cool. I'm going to go and look for some icons so they're fairly plain, you know, kind of silhouette of something and see how they work. I will play with that at some point. Just want to show you this example of the emoji one that you saw earlier. So you'll notice in this one the only words in this word art <laughs> is I love music. Now all the rest of it is actually emojis. It's little icons, little pictures instead of other words to make the shape of the heart. I did do this all with words um, in, as a first example but then I realised that I could use this emoji option. So you end up with a menu, a, a sort of a list of well, you can see like a grid of all the different um, little icons and you just copy and paste uh, whichever ones you want to include in your Word art. You copy and paste them into the Word list and then when you click Visualise, up pops this um, this nice Word art with the picture and the uh, the shape of the heart. So I really like this one too. I think it's, um, it's really effective. I probably could have chosen fewer emoji I don't know maybe not <laughs> I was going to do another one which was blues and just stick with guitar and quaver and treble clef or something like that so you could limit it tightly you'll notice also that I I deliberately included in there not all music icons I put some hearts and I put like a little fireworks one which is that little you know um, flower shaped one uh, just because I th thought it made a good effect so that's word art just as my little bonus there now you might be wondering or curious about what do I use me personally what what do I use when I'm creating resources and I mean you probably know from now that I have used all of the things that I've talked about tonight but uh, on a regular basis I use all of these things I really do use all of these things because I just find that Sometimes things are better suited to Keynote. So I don't use PowerPoint so much because I have Keynote on the Mac, but those two are essentially the same. So I do use Keynote at times, and I'm in fact using that right this minute, uh, because for instance, in this situation where I'm presenting online, it's just kind of safer if I have something that lives on my laptop. <laughs> and I do like some of the formatting options that Keynote gives me as opposed to Google Slides or Canva. So I do use Keynote quite a lot. I do use Google Slides as well. And I am more and more using Canva and that is really largely to do with those templates and all those design elements in there. So I just love the fact with Canva that you know, the thing that's time consuming and frustrating when you're making your own resources is, you know, you set out to make a poster and you're like, okay, I want an image of a guitar or an image of a person singing. And so then you have to go to another website where you'll search for the image and then you'll find one or two that you like and you download them. And then you go back to your, say, Keynote tool and you'll pop them in there and you go, ah, it's not quite right. I need to go back to the other website and find something else. And then you'll go back again. There's a lot of back and forth and so the thing that is great in Canva is that it's just all there. You can search in the library, click on something, add it to your design and as soon as you don't like it, 
you just press delete and look for the next thing that's already popped up in those search results. So it just makes things a lot easier. So probably out of the the ones that I've mentioned, I probably use Google Slides a little bit less, but um, not for any particular reason, but I definitely do use all of them. So picking the right tool for the job is a really good idea. All right. So that's it for the main training part of the day. Question and answer time. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I know that it's light on tonight in terms of people uh, being here. So thank you for coming if you did come. It's a terrible time for those in the US, which is why there are not many people here. I'm just going to switch back to not sharing my screen for a moment uh, so I get to talk to you properly. Just going to switch back into just a minute. And I will open up my chat window here so I can see what's going on. Is that going back again? Oh, I'm still on screen share. That's why. Hold on. There we go. So, uh, yeah, so if you do have a question, I was just saying it's a terrible time this month for the US, um, our US friends, because it's about four or it's coming up to 5 a.m. now uh, for those on the eastern side. And I think it's even worse, obviously, for those on the western side of the states. Um, it's just this month where we're still on daylight savings time and they've already changed, I think, to their, I don't know, I don't know. It, it confuses me every time. Anyway. It's not a good time difference. Uh, it gets a little bit better, I think, next month and then the one after that's uh, better again. So, yeah, so if you do have any questions about what I've shown tonight, feel free to type them into the chat window. If you've got questions which are not related to tonight's training session, uh, feel free to ask those as well. And it can be anything music tech related and uh, I'm happy to try and answer it as best I can. Jan's loving Canva at the moment. Yep, <laughs> you're getting kicked out of school now. Okay, <laughs> you're still at school, I didn't realise. I hope to see you, uh, Jan, in Perth uh, in well, it's actually quite soon, maybe is it three or four weeks or something. Anyway, I will catch up with you then. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm loving Canva too, so it's really good. Hello, Tori from Sydney. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry. You're not the only one that forgets to change their name from guest. I think it's funny because then sometimes I have to discreet people as guest 2732, which makes you sound like a prisoner or something. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> um, oh, great. Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm, I'm just reading a comment about posting notes, guitar and ukulele chords on the website. Yeah. And that reminds me just while I'm reading the rest of your comment, uh, I will just... Uh, share this I've got a weight clipboard set up with links from tonight's session so I'll just copy and paste that across is this the right one yes so if you want to um, get some links to do with tonight's session they're just on this um, wakelet is a, a place where you can share links to things so I've popped them on there you're using paint at the moment. All right, to, to guitar charts, yeah. Yeah, check out Canva. I think you'll be really oh, pleasantly surprised. There's just so much cool stuff in there. Uh, the thing I, I do like about Canva is that the people who make the templates and the design elements, so the clip art and the images and stuff, they're, they're kind of cooler designers <laughs> than some of the other places where you can find things. So... I know if I go looking for clip art and so on, it's kind of hard to find some that are, you know, sort of modern and fresh looking and I really like that. So um, that's where I think Canva's, you know, got, got some benefits there because they have this collection of really great, great resources which look modern and fresh. Uh, so, yes, um, do go and, and try. I think, you, oh, gosh, I haven't used paint very much but I have a feeling you'll find it's much more limited than things you can do in Canva and even in Google Slides um, and, and the presentation tool options. So if you if you ever get into creating resources to sell on Teachers Pay Teachers, um, the most common comment I find from people who are trying to sell their own resources there is that everybody starts out creating their worksheets and so on inside uh, Word or Google Docs or Pages on a Mac and then they realise that nearly everyone on Teachers Pay Teachers is using PowerPoint or Keynote to decide, uh, design their things or slides or now Canva. So um, things are, are sort of shifting and changing. But 
if you've been using something with limited features and um, formatting options, then it's really refreshing when you change. Uh, <laughs> uh, just reading that comment. Yeah, oh, good Jan's register for March 22nd. Yes, fantastic, Jan. Um, yeah, Google Slides is fantastic. I know, I think it's easy with the Google suite of tools to stick to what you use frequently. So, you know, I at, at, the, at the start when I started using Google stuff generally years ago, I was only using Google Docs, that was it, nothing else. And then I started using the spreadsheets for a bit, you know, I, I started to sort of add that in. Now I I don't use, for word processing documents and spreadsheets, I don't use anything else. I only use Google Slide, uh, Google Docs and Google Sheets. Um, I don't use the local versions on my Mac, I, I, so I don't really use Pages and I don't use the Numbers, which is um, equivalent to Excel on my Mac at all. I only use the Google versions because the collaboration and the sharing and me being able to send the link to someone is so much easier and I can access stuff on every on you know all devices. So so I was later to slides as well. I probably used um, started using slides a couple of years ago. But I have noticed when I've gone to conferences which are tech ed tech conferences, not music specific, uh, so many of the presenters just present using Google Slides and then share the link to their presentation to all the people attending uh, because it means that they can just share everything in one easy go and links are active then and it's super easy. I will probably start doing that too. So, yeah, do explore Google Slides as well. And like I said, there's times where you use different things for different reasons and I really do use all of them at different times. <laughs> so, yes, there you go. I'm glad you're exploring new options though. It's really hard to try new things when you've been using something for a long time and you're very used to it, but it's definitely worth it. All right. Any other questions from anyone? When you check out that Wakelet board, if you haven't explored Wakelet, just as an aside, Wakelet is not a design tool. Wakelet's a super easy, um, great way to share collections of links to things. And I'm actually using it as my, like if I'm researching a topic and want to save links to come back to later, like if I don't have time to read articles or check out, you know, apps and stuff, I'm actually just adding them to Wakelet boards and then coming back to them later on. It's really, it's been really useful because there's an app and there's, you know, so uh, yesterday I was looking at, uh, I think it was Twitter. And someone had mentioned something which I really did want to save. So I, I was reading a blog article sort of inside Twitter still. And then I could just tap the share button or save button inside Twitter. And because I've got the Wakelet app installed, that pops up as an option now for me to save to. So it, I tapped on it and it said, which Wakelet board do you want to save it to or collection? So I, I said, okay, this one. And then it just was really seamless. So it's a really good way of capturing things when you're on your phone. That's what I like. Excellent. All right. I'll hang around for a little bit. I'll actually leave the chat window open for a little bit, but if there are no more questions, I will start to wind up. Um, I was mentioning earlier, if you weren't on at the beginning, I've just returned from Texas yesterday morning <laughs> at 9.15 a.m., and prior to getting home, so basically I was awake from Melbourne time Monday night at about 12, like just after midnight Monday night. And then I was awake until about 10.30 last night. So nearly 24 hours. And then I did sleep and it's really hit me today. So, so I'm feeling like I am not making sense tonight so much and stumbling over words and things. So I'm really looking forward to just having a good night's sleep tonight and kind of trying to get back onto the right time zone. Uh, yeah, it's funny. On the way to Texas, it's totally fine. I have no issue and don't really get jet lag that way. But coming back, it's just hard work. <laughs> Oh, great. Oh, Canvas, good. Yeah, do it. Yeah, I, I don't know, guest 1575, I have to say that because I haven't, I haven't got your name there. But um, if you haven't already given it a go, yeah, totally just, just try it out. Yeah, large posters for the music classroom would be cool. I, I think with the posters, I'm not quite sure how the dimensions work, but uh, you can basically print them at a normal size on a normal printer and then blow them up to a larger size or 
you can actually send the file to a print service of some kind and get them printed at the full size in the first place. So the poster templates are amazing. Like they're just so, they're just so useful and so cool. So when you, like when I start out designing posters, sometimes I have a kind of a picture in my mind of what I want it to look like. And then it's frustrating because you're trying to line text up and then it doesn't fit properly on the page or you can't get it to work the way you want. You really want to include this image, but now it doesn't fit uh, and it's frustrating. Using their templates is much easier because a proper designer has thought it all through for you and fiddled around and yeah, it looks really good. So yes, give that a go. It'd be really cool. There's some great icons in there. I love a silhouette. A silhouette looks really effective. So you don't need to have a lot of fancy you know, photos or anything. You can just have a like an icon version of a guitar or saxophone or whatever it is you want to put on your poster. That looks really effective. Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And I will look forward to seeing you next month. I'm just going to put my screen sharing back on because I'll just show you the date and time for next month's session. Uh, and I will also mention, I'll just hit play here, did I do that properly? Seeing if my screen will change. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. So if you are interested in joining the Midnight Music community because you might want some more help and you just want to see what it's like, we've actually got a, a trial offer link under the video that you're watching on the page now. So if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a link for that there. And this is a place where you can get PD certificates for the training that you do. So once the recording of this live session goes into the community, we also then have a button where you can download a, a certificate for the time that you've spent watching, um, watching the training. So the next training session is in March and, oh, I forgot to put the date there. I think it's the 18th of March. I'll double check this in a second. And the topic for next month, we're actually going to do a full month of Google-related tips and tricks. So there may even be something about slides coming up during the month where we do blog posts and so on. But for the next month's training, I'm actually going to focus on Google Keep. And if you haven't explored that as a tool, I can also highly recommend that. So that's the next session there. Let me just go back to me and I'll find the actual date. I will update update the page that you're looking at right now with the date for the new one. Uh, but I will tell you verbally right now what it is. 18th of March, I was correct. So for those in Australia, um, it's going to be 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time. Are we still on daylight time? It's 11 a.m. No matter what it is, it's for, for Melbourne, Sydney. It's Melbourne, Sydney time, 11 a.m. <laughs> I, I know the others of you can work out uh, around that. Uh, and that's because that is 8 p.m. for those in the U.S. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. They might be down daylight time by then. So I'm looking forward to that one. Google Keep, if you haven't already checked that out, it's kind of a to-do list making thing. Uh, I use it every day now and it's a new-ish tool for me, which I'm really loving. I started using it late last year and it's been really good. So I'll talk more about that then. All right, I'm going to sign off. Thank you everyone for coming along and great to see some of you online and I will look forward to seeing you again next month.